He actually borrowed the, the markup language SGML and modified it to, to create HTML, the, the lingua franca of, of the web. And of course, he was building on top of the internet as well, right? If he'd had to invent the entire internet from scratch, he would have never been able to do it, right? It would have been far too ambitious a, a project to create a global network of computers talking to each other. But because the internet had already been invented by Al Gore, no, that's not true. Al Gore never said that. It's a cheap joke, uh, but irresistible somehow. Because the internet was already there for him to kind of build freely on top of, he was able to build this kind of layer on top of all this other important work that had been, that had been done. And it wasn't until the late 80s that Berners-Lee finally went to his bosses and told them what he'd been doing all this time as a side project, right? I mean, he kind of had the meeting where he said, I may have invented a global communications platform in my spare time at work. Uh, can this be part of my day job, right? That was the actual conversation he had. So I think that what you see in the case of Berners-Lee is that he had, for whatever reason, the kind of sensibility and a work environment that allowed him to keep this hunch alive for a long period of time, allowed it to kind of mature and to develop in this, in, in this new direction um, and to turn it into something that the world was ready for. One of the key things about the story of Tim Berners-Lee is that the world was not ready for the World Wide Web in 1982. There simply weren't enough personal computers out there, much less personal computers attached to networks. And so the idea was literally ahead of its time and it needed to both develop in Berners-Lee's mind, but also it needed the rest of the world to kind of catch up with it. And that takes us to another key element in, in the history of innovation. It's a, it's a wonderful term coined by the, the complexity scientist Stuart Kaufman many years ago that I've been kind of looking forward to a way to work into a book for, for about 10 years now. Um, Kaufman's term is the adjacent possible. And his idea is that at any point in the history of technology or science or indeed of biology, um, at any given moment in the history of, of a system like that, there are a set of possible moves that you can make and a much larger set of, of moves that are not yet possible. Right? In, the, in the early days of life, when you have molecules bouncing off each other in the primordial soup, it's impossible for some of those molecules to suddenly kind of coalesce and form a chimpanzee. Right? There are too many intermediary steps of evolution that have to happen. By the same token, it's impossible to invent a microwave oven in 1650. Right? You just can't do it. So you have to, in thinking about innovation, you have to think about what, what are the kind of adjacencies? What are the possible moves that you can make? What are the tools out there? that you can borrow and remix to turn into something radically new. And there's a wonderful story that I think really captures the, 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 the value of thinking in terms of adjacent possibilities. Um, this is a neonatal incubator. As, as most of you probably know, this is one of the most important kind of life extending technologies of, uh, of, of the 20th century. We've, we've done an amazing amount of progress in reducing infant mortality rates for prematurely born babies because of neonatal incubators. And one of the problems that we have still in the developing world, where infant mortality rates are really high, is that we'll ship over these fancy $50,000 incubators from state-of-the-art hospitals in the, in the developed world, and we'll ship them to a, you know, a mid-sized African village that's wrestling with terrible infant mortality rates, and this is a miraculous technology, it'll do wonders, it'll make a big difference for the first year, and then it will break, right? Some part will fail, and the whole thing will go dark, and because the, the, the kind of environment of this mid-sized African village doesn't have the spare parts and it doesn't have the technical expertise to fix the thing, the machine just stays broken and it basically stops being useful. This is a big problem with advanced technological kind of medical aid to the developing world. So a couple years ago, a wonderful group associated with MIT called Design That Matters got together and tried to solve this problem thinking about it in terms of the adjacent possible of a mid-sized African village. What are the tools and the technology and what are the, the kind of uh, knowledge bases that are re read, readily available in, in that kind of environment? And they looked around and they said, listen, you're not seeing a lot of microwave ovens, you're not seeing a lot of DVRs, but what you are seeing are Toyota 4Runners on every corner, right? They, they know how to keep their cars running. And so they decided to build a neonatal incubator made entirely out of car parts. And this is what they created. This is the Neo Nurture device. It just won Time Magazine's Best Innovation of the Year award last year. From the outside, it looks like a nice little medical device. On the inside, its guts are entirely automotive. It gets its heat uh, from the headlights. Um, the fans circulate the air, <coughs> runs off a car battery, 
Um, alarms are triggered by door chimes. So if you can fix that Toyota 4Runner, you can, you can fix this neonatal incubator. If you have the parts available to you to fix your Toyota, you can fix this thing. Brilliant idea. And that, I think, is one of the lessons here. We're not just, the, the, the trick of innovation is not to kind of put yourself off in isolation and try and invent something from scratch. The trick is really to get more parts on the table so that you can remix and recombine them into, into new forms. Now, in looking through history, I, I've been drawn to these spaces that have a long kind of track record of unusually innovative thinking. And one of my favorites that I've actually written about in a, in a couple of books is the, the 18th century coffee house. 18th century coffee house is a tremendous engine of innovation in the, in the age of the Enlightenment. Um, an extraordinary number of ideas, breakthrough ideas in science and in politics and in religion come out of the coffee house environment. Um, so the question is, what is it about this, this space? I, I call this kind of space a, a liquid network. There's a certain kind of fluidity of ideas and exchange and connection that's happening and people talking to each other in, in spontaneous and serendipitous ways, um, making these, these new connections. The other thing that's worth pointing out, it's a little bit incidental to our story, but it's worth pointing out about the 18th century coffee house. Another key to its innovative powers is the fact that they were drinking coffee in the first place. Because until coffee and tea became affordable enough for the mass and elite populations of, uh, of Europe in the early 1700s, the daytime beverage of choice for the entire population was alcohol. Right? People would wake up in the morning and they would drink beer for breakfast and then they would have more beer during the middle of the day and wine at lunch. A lot of gin was drunk in the 1600s. Um, and so you effectively had a population that was just drunk all day long. That was the reality of life in Europe during this period. And so when coffee and tea came to Europe uh, in the early 1700s, just think about your own lives. If you were drinking all day long, just theoretically, um, and then you switched to drinking coffee and tea all day long, you too would have better ideas on the job and would be more creative and innovative in your thinking, right? So, but the, but the other thing, so it's not an accident that a great flowering of intellectual activity happens when a society moves from a depressant to a stimulant in their, in their beverage choices. But the other key thing about the, the space of the coffee house is that it was a multidisciplinary space. It was people talking to each other across fields of interest. Um, they weren't just focused on a single specialized field, but they were connecting across these disciplines. And that power of, of connection over fields of expertise is, is, a, is a key driver in the history of innovation. One of, one of my favorite examples of this is, is, dates back to a much older and, and even more important communications revolution, which was Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. For years, Gutenberg worked away on his movable type system and very advanced work in metallurgy and also with inks. He did all this very high-tech stuff, getting the inks to, to, to set properly on the page. But he was lacking a key ingredient. He didn't have a pressing mechanism for all this new technology he was working on. And so he was stuck for, for quite a long period of time. It turned out it was, it was grape harvesting season in Rhineland, Germany, so he goes up into the hills to drink some wine because coffee hadn't come yet. And he's hanging out there, and he looks over, and he sees this ancient technology of the screw press, which Vinters had been using for literally 2,000 years to, to press grapes. And he looks at this thing, and he says, ah, that's what I'm missing. And so he borrows this very old technology designed for something totally different, and ports it over, attaches it to this new kind of state-of-the-art technology that he's developed. And he takes a machine that was designed for pressing grapes, and turns it into a machine for printing Bibles. That is so often the case in the history of technologies. Tools designed for one thing get ported over and, and, and put to new use in a, in a new context. And I think what that suggests to us is a really a kind of a different perspective on the, on the importance of diversity in our experiences, in our work environments, in our, in our kind of media flows of information. A number of years ago, a, a, a scholar at Stanford, at the business school at Stanford named Martin Reif, did a study of unusually innovative people, um, both entrepreneurs and people who are unusually innovative in kind of the corporate workforce. And he was interested in their social networks. This was before the age of Facebook and Twitter, so he was interested in the people that they actually knew, right? And so he's hanging out with, with all these people and he's tracking who their friends are. And he looks at basically two groups. He looks at this unusually innovative group and then he looks at a group that to, to put it gently, were kind of less innovative in their careers. 
which is the part of the experiment that you don't want to be invited to participate in if they call you up and say, you seem very dull. Um, could I ask you a few questions about your friends? Just hang up the phone, because it's not a good thing. And he interviews them, and what he finds is this signature pattern in their social networks, which is that they have all these weak tie connections to a, a much more diverse range of professions than the less innovative group does. So they themselves are, you know, they're a marketing director at an ad agency, but they know an architect and a popular science writer and a government contract lawyer and a poet and a plumber. Whereas the other group just knows other people at other ad agencies. And Roy's point, which you can see embodied in, in, in so many of these stories, is that by connecting to people who are working on different kinds of problems and have different sets of kind of skills and, and metaphors for the way that they go about their business, by connecting to them, you're constantly finding new ideas that you can bring over into a new domain and put it to, to some new kind of surprising use. And what that suggests, I think, is, in a sense, the non-political argument for diversity, right? It's not just that we will be more tolerant as a society if we surround ourselves with people who are different from us. It's also that, on some basic level, we'll be smarter. We'll be more original and innovative in our thinking. Now, if there's a story that from, from the book that really kind of brings all these different themes together that I, that's really my favorite story from the book. Um, it's, it's one that involves the, the, the launch of Sputnik, the, the Soviet first man-made satellite uh, to orbit the Earth that, that the Soviet Union launched in October 4th of 1957. Now news of Sputnik uh, first arrived, Sputnik launched on a Friday, news of it first arrived in the United States over the weekend, and our story really begins uh, on Monday morning at a place in Laurel, Maryland, not too far from where I grew up, um, called the Applied Physics Lab, associated with MIT. Did a lot of work for the military. Now you can imagine what, what happens when Sputnik launches and you're at a physics lab with works for the military. This is big, this is big news. And everybody's hanging out. This is like nerd heaven, right? What happened? How did they do it? You know? And so they're all hanging out in the liquid network, um, having this kind of fluid conversation of the, in the cafeteria at the APL. And there are these two kids there, Geyer and Weifenbach. And they're trading stories about this. And, and these are 25-year-old PhD students um, working at the APL. And one of them says, hey, we should try and listen to this thing. It's got to be sending some, some kind of signal, right? And their colleagues are like, oh, that's a great idea. You're absolutely right. We should, we should go tune in. And so they go back to their little office cubicle area. And, and they've got a little antenna and amplifier set up. And so they start kind of scanning the airwaves for this, for this signal. And it turns out that, as, as broadcasters, they made Sputnik send a very clear signal um, because the Soviets were afraid that people would think it was a hoax, basically. So after just you know, an hour or two, they've picked up this little 20 megahertz signal that's going beep, beep, from Sputnik. And these two kids are all excited. They've got their headphones on, and people are coming by and putting on the headphones. It's just a simple little beep, but it's like the most beautiful music they've ever heard, right? And there's no point to this. It's just a hunch, just this feeling of an interesting problem that would be kind of cool to solve, right? Then they notice that there's small frequency variations um, between each of the beeps. And so they figure out that they can actually use the Doppler effect to calculate how fast the satellite is moving. And then after a little bit of time, they start to realize, gosh, they could do some other math and figure out the points at which the satellite is closest to their antenna and the points at which it's furthest away. And to do that, they have to borrow some time on the giant room-sized Univac computer that they've just gotten at the APL. But they get it all figured out. And within a matter of weeks, purely for fun, purely as a side project, they have calculated the exact orbit of Sputnik around the planet. So everybody's excited about this. Again, no real point to this, but it's a great exercise, a great hack. A couple of weeks later, the, their boss, this guy Frank McClure, pulls them into his office and kind of shuts the door ominously and says, listen, I got to talk to you guys about this Sputnik thing you did. You guys calculated an unknown location in space from a known location on the ground. And I'm wondering if you could do it the other way. Could you calculate an unknown location on the ground if you knew the location in space? And there are Guy and wife back say, well, I don't know. We have to think about it. And so they go back, they run the numbers, and they come back a few days later, and they say, yes, you could. In fact, it would be easier. And so McClure kind of smiles, and he says, well, that's good news, boys, because you see, we have these new nuclear submarines that we're building. And it turns out that it's very difficult to get your missiles to land right on Moscow the way you want them to if you don't know exactly where your submarines are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. 
So we're thinking we're going to use this crazy hack you've developed here uh, with Sputnik, and we're going to throw up some of these new satellites and use it to coordinate our submarines and our missiles. And that, as you can imagine, is the birth of GPS. Now, you know where this story is going, right? For a long time, GPS is a very closed, proprietary, military-only standard um, used precisely for managing uh, submarines and, and missiles, although thankfully not for dropping them on Moscow. Um, but over time, it starts to get opened up. In 1982, after the Korean air crash, it becomes open for civilian use, and more and more kind of accuracy gets built into the civilian use parts of the system. Meanwhile, that giant room-sized UNIVAC computer is shrinking down and getting more and more powerful over time. And meanwhile, Tim Berners-Lee's invention, designed originally for scholarly research, creating hypertext links between academic papers, turns out to be useful for all these other things that Tim Berners-Lee never dreamed of, but were, which were possible because he created an open platform. And all of a sudden, 10 years ago, five years ago, the web starts getting populated by all this geographic information that people can grab, information about local restaurants and local schools and crime reports and, and maps and, and so on. And now, I guarantee you, just about everyone in this room is walking around with a device that is talking to the descendants of those satellites using some variation of that original hack that Geyer and Weifenbach came up with, only we're using it for these purposes that the original inventors never dreamed of, right? And in fact, I guarantee you someone here in this room has used said satellites and said devices to locate a nearby coffee house sometime in, in the last week, right? And that is the beauty of innovation when it's done right. That is the kind of emergent, serendipitous power of innovation platforms when they're set up possibly, when they're set up to explore the adjacent possible. You think you're just following this crazy hunch with no real purpose, then you think you're fighting the Cold War, and then it turns out, 50 years later, you're just helping somebody find a soy latte. <laughs> that is the power of innovation when it's done right. Chance favors the connected mind. Thank you very much. And now, to present...